Okay. All right, I'll call the meeting to order. October 10th, Port Edward Public Schools Board of Education meeting. First item is roll call. Uh, ben Martinson. Here. Leo Thomasgard. Here. John Davin. Here. Carrie Hildebrandt. I am also here. All right. And first item of business is report from student representatives and student recognition. We have with us today two members of our student council. Uh, a third one I think is probably delayed at football practice at the moment, so may get here or may not, but we will absolutely hear from uh, these two ladies. And I will say this before they get started. They are new student council members as they're both ninth grade students this year. So they're going to do awesome right now. So up to you ladies. Uh, my name is Shayla McDonald. I'm a freshman. I am in drama club, student council, and volleyball. And I also plan to play softball. Um, my activities that I do out of school are camping, and I'm unsure about my future plans. Um, I'm Erilyn, and I'm also a freshman. And the things that I'm in right now is student council and volleyball but I do plan on playing basketball and softball. And I mostly, for fun, I just go s play softball with my family. And my future plans, I'm unsure about. Okay, Friday at six, there is the parade and then the community pep rally and bonfire to follow. Saturday, there's the football game, the football homecoming game at 1 p.m versus the Lincoln Hornets and homecoming starts at 8 to midnight and the Grand March is at 8.30. And our blood drive is also on the on October 30th and the volleyball game tomorrow at home versus Marion at 6 o'clock. And Miss Miller has a speed meeting tomorrow for to determine whether we are on the road or home when we, if we lose, we are out. That's yeah. CD meeting tomorrow night? Yes. Yes. Tonight. Or tonight. Yeah. Right now she's tonight. Yeah. Yeah. Tonight. Sorry. Yeah. Um, Hayden was supposed to report on football, but He's not here. But they do have a game this Saturday. Yes, they have the game at Saturday at 1. And I think Hayden also, did Hayden also have a drama club? Yeah. Yep. Um, and, uh, yeah. In November, and the date, it's this okay. November 9th, is the drama club production. So, what was the date on that? Uh, November 9th. And it's a murder mystery. So. Just one, sh one showing, just Friday night, or is that Saturday night? Just one, on Friday. Any questions for the ladies? Huh? Thank you for your report. Thank you. Thank you. Free to go? Thank you. Or you can stay and listen to the rest of the meeting. <laughs> There's extra copies of the agenda over there. Thank you very much. All right, the next item is the President's Report. All members are in attendance, but Kathy is excused absence. Next board meeting is, regular board meeting is November 14th. And we do have the budget hearing and annual meeting, which is coming up October 29th on a Monday. So next item is a proclamation National School Lunch Program. I'll read them. Whereas the National School Lunch Program plays an important role in helping to ensure that every child in the nation is ready to learn because a hungry or undernourished child is less likely to be an eager and attentive student, and whereas the National School Lunch Program has a demonstrated commitment to our children's health and well-being, serving nutritious meals that are balanced for vitamins and calories which supports healthy eating patterns, and whereas in Wisconsin over 2,400 public and private schools participate in the National School Lunch Program and serve 470,000 lunches each school day, 
directly supporting Wisconsin's Every Child a Graduate agenda. And whereas the success of this effort is due largely to resourceful and creative local food service administrators, managers, and staff working in cooperation with parents, teachers, community groups, government personnel, and students. Therefore, be it resolved that October 15th through the 19th, 2018, be proclaimed as National School Lunch Week, a time to celebrate the importance of a program that helps keep students nourished so they can learn. Signed by Tony Evers, State Superintendent of Public Instruction. Right. Next item of business is administrative reports. Kyle. Thank you. <coughs> Audience members. Um, so the first thing I'll, I'll do this kind of in the backwards order. Uh, so I'll talk about the, so I had two items, um, testing results and enrollment. I'll just cover enrollment first. Um, you should have in front of you a paper the first chart you see on that is our third Friday count for uh, this past uh, September. And this shows at each grade level several items. Shows the head count at the grade level, so that's the actual kids sitting in the seats. Shows open enrollment in, open enrollment out. Uh, then it's 6603 and or other arrangements that would affect the enrollment account for a student. Um, for us, it's probably mostly 6603s or, or uh, other types of virtual arrangements or things that are going on and then in the end you get a total uh, if you notice as you if you look at the 4k line the head count is 20 open and roll in it says minus 8 so when we do our calculation for enrollment we have to subtract the open enrolled in students from our enrollment we add back in the open enrolled out students and we also get to add back in 6603 or other things that are out there. Um, so you can see, although the head count's 20, the total count for that grade level due to the open enrollments being subtracted and added and, and, and whatnot is 18. Um, kind of interesting, you can go down and take a look at each grade level, how many open enrollment in, so kids actually coming here, how many are out. Certainly some grade levels we have more coming in than going out. Um, first grade would be that way with 10 coming in and three going out. Um, so although there's 37 students in that grade, you can see that the, that the total count that we get to report in the end is 31. Although 37 are so seated in the seats. More kids coming in, but our number is lower? Yes. <laughs> it's because we don't have as many going out because we get to add back in the kids okay. coming or going out. Going out. Okay. Um, if you get to the bottom line there, you'll see we have 111 students open enrolled into the district. We have 90 open enrolled uh, out along with a whole bunch of 6603 agreements and things that have been done over the years. A lot of those are, uh, we do have several students on virtual agreements that have been on that for several years. Um, and it, you can see some grade levels, it is more um, more open enrollment out. The 11th grade would be a prime example of that. You can see there's quite a few students in the 11th grade that were open enrolled out. Most of our open enrollment outs have never stepped foot in our schools, ever. Um, some have recently been students who've moved into their families, moved into the district. Yeah. The student was already attending Wisconsin Rapids or student was already attending uh, Nakusa or something along those lines. So. Um, so the families chose to stay there. But the vast majority of our open enrollment out students have never stepped foot in the schools. Um, we still continue to get phone calls on open enrollment uh, from families and parents. Um, and it'll certainly be something we'll look at. Now, we'll make this even more interesting and probably even <coughs> more confusing. The next chart. Uh, so. If you look down, and I'm going to use the current year, so if you look down at 2018, our head count is 443. Our third Friday count is 440 due to all the ins and outs. However, our revenue limit count with summer school added in is 436. You're probably asking, why does it continue to go down? Um, what happens is two things happen. 
One is for that revenue limit count, 4K students are only counted at 60%. So the 20 that you see there is only being counted actually at 60% when it gets down to the revenue limit. So we subtract even more off of that number, but we get to add back in a grand total of three for summer school. So all of our summer school students and all the summer school programming gets us three students added back in. Now, here's the, here's the thing on this. Um, that's not our actual, that's not our. That's not our actual summer school count. It's what we get to count for the revenue limit based on formulas that they use from summer school. Um, so we actually add back in three. We've added back in three. Stacy could tell you she does, compiles the report. It's been, it's, we've, we actually, yeah, but it's how many years? Seven years? And we've done. Since I've been doing it. So it's been three, three. <laughs> so our numbers is very stable there. It takes an enormous amount of hours and kids to get you one student added on for your summer school. Thousands of hours. <laughs> I think it's 40,800 minutes. Yeah, yeah. Is it's what I divide it by. And we're not even really at seven. We're at 6.97 and they round it up to seven. Yeah. So, but we only get to count three of those for our revenue limit. So, 436. However, go to the last line. We're being funded as if we have 388 sitting in our building. So our actual funding is based on the 388. If you go back and take a look uh, at 17, our head count was 408, our third Friday count 401, our revenue limit 391, and we were, um, our average was 380 at that time. And you can see how that average uh, between 16, 17, and 18 really stayed fairly steady. Um, a big drop off between 15 and 16, that big drop off was really when the decline really had hit, hit, that, um, hit that bottom. Um, we were coming off of uh, like 2012, 13, we were in the 420s. Uh, down to like 410 the next year so that that's why that 394 was still hanging around up there um, but even so the one thing we can do is predict out to next year we already know that our revenue limit number will go up to 408 next year so our revenue limit average goes to 408 so at least we're we're making some ground there um, it's is it as quick as we would like it to be no um, is it a positive? Absolutely. Every student on our revenue limit is worth approximately $10,800. I'll just give you that as an approximation. I don't have the number sitting in front of me. So the simple fact that we can be 20 more students next year, multiply that times that amount. Now that does not completely solve the budget issues. It goes a long way to helping it. It doesn't completely solve it. Okay, so um, it definitely helps it. And as we talked a month ago uh, on the revenue limit, worst case scenario is, I don't even wanna say what we showed you last month was absolute worst case, but we knew that going in. We showed you a, we showed you a set of scenarios just based on some, some assumptions that we didn't have all that information for. Now we're able to start filling these in. So when we come and look at that again in November, we'll really be able to fill it in. There's still a few numbers we don't know yet. Um, the, the, we used 410 as the FTE, but the FTE is actually 440 or 436. So we'll be able to go fill that in with that number and start running those calculations. The other numbers we'll get some finals on are gonna be um, in the next couple of days. We'll get our final valuation for our equalized value. About 11 million more is what we're thinking in equalized value. That's huge for our district. That's huge. Um, that that's good in the sense what that does. It's it's going to spread that that levy out amongst more tax dollars. So um, in in the long run, that's a good thing for the taxpayer to have more value in the district. Um, so, but it can show show you how. We can talk about kids sitting in the bay. When you talk about what our enrollment is or what, what our numbers are, that's a moving target sometimes. What number do you want? You know, I mean, it, it really, this, 
the reason I wanted to show you that is it truly does change. Um, the good news, I think, is if you look at, so our high school enrollment right now, so I, I'd have to go in and recalculate. Last I knew it was like 112, 110. If you start looking at the current ninth grade next year when we bring in the eighth grade and then the seventh grade, our high school enrollment's gonna be teetering right back up to that 440, 450, or 440, 140 to 150 mark in very short order, in just a couple of years. So, um, and you can see there is some fluctuation up and down um, in the elementary, but that 37 sit in first grade, the 37 sit in fourth grade, truly that 28 sitting in kindergarten, if you remember last year, we did have a conversation very early on about the fact that we might only need one kindergarten teacher. Well, no, I mean, we were, we certainly got to the point where that number changed from the 4K. So just a little bit there on the enrollment. Any questions on that before I switch gears to testing? I'm gonna have to flip the lights and I'm gonna show you some information on the testing. So testing data did get released by the state of Wisconsin. a week ago, well, earlier this week, actually. Uh, so we're gonna bring up some of that information. So what I'm gonna show you is information that is publicly available, and I'm gonna show you the public way to get to it. I thought that would be a good way to show it if anybody's watching at home or, or, or whatnot, they can see how to access our pub, the public side of our data. We have a much more robust version that is school only that gives you the same data but it, you can you can really I don't want to say it, you can really drill into it by student on the version that we have that's school only um, the other thing that is going to come out in about a month is our school report card I don't want to I've seen the preliminary copies they're not the finals um, Whereas last year, I will say this, whereas last year where the high school, we struggled and there were a couple of things that kind of um, piled on, uh, uh, on us. Um, a, a goofy graduation rate one year and some other things. Yeah, I believe you'll see some, I'm gonna say, I believe you'll see some improvement on that, some significant improvement from what it was a year ago. Um, I don't wanna say for sure because that's embargoed and I don't wanna tell what I've seen, I'll just say I think you're going to see some improvement. So, test scores though. Um, so this is a website called Wise Dash. You can search this. This is a public website. It's part of the Department of Public Instruction. Um, and what we're going to show you is school data for Port Edwards. Now, we do really we have two different sets of tests that get reported out. One is called the forward, and that replaced, if um, you remember back long ago, there was the WKCE, and then for a year or two we had the Badger exam, now we have the forward exam. Uh, the other set of test data that's really readily available on here is our ACT test data for our juniors. But with this forward exam, this is testing our students really in the elementary and middle school grades on English language arts, math, science, social studies. It tests 10th grade students, I'm gonna nod over at our counselor, 10th grade students in social studies only for forward exam. Yes. Yeah, just wanted to double check that, yeah. So when you see this data, this is all grade levels combined into one. So, um, and I'm actually gonna pull up a little different version of this for you to take a look at, so just bear with me a moment. Hopefully I didn't lose it. Come on. So what's really interesting about this website is you can compare your school against any other school. You can compare it against the state, uh, all kinds of things. I don't know that that's always useful necessarily because um, it maybe is just a good measure 
kind of how you're doing, but every school's circumstances are different. So this is our school district, English language arts, and I did put up the state data as well, so you can see what the state data is. This is um, all the grade levels that get tested at the elementary, middle, and um, for English language arts on the Ford exam. Uh, we don't test first and second grade students on this or kindergarten students. Um, we can break this out further for you. We can break it out by a whole bunch of different pieces. I'm not going to do that this evening at the moment. I just wanted to kind of give you an overview. We can do grade groups so you can see at the middle level. So what you're looking at here, just so that you know, the state looks at how many students are proficient or advanced and how many students are not proficient. And, and that's really the gauges the state is looking at. We actually break it down, they break it down even further. Um, there's actually four categories. There's advanced, proficient, um, and then there's two categories below that. So when you look at the not proficient, um, some of those kids are within a couple of points of being proficient. Some of those kids are a whole long ways from being proficient. Same with when you look at the proficient, some of those kids are right on that edge and some are advanced. So, um, but this gives you just maybe a general sense, at least as you look at this. So this is middle school English language arts. I'll show you elementary. I'm not gonna show you high school because there is no high school data in this one, except for social studies. Um, here's the elementary. Really what we're going to tell you here is we've got some work we got to do. You know, we got to keep moving kids, kids up. And we're able to, at the district level now, drill into this data even further by grade level even further, figure out at what grade levels are we seeing these deficiencies, and then where we're able to provide some interventions as we need it. One of the things that you, you just, you know, Kara talked about quite a bit earlier this year was that move to the new, to that new curriculum for reading. In part, that's some of the response from where we see those test, test results headed. Um, the other thing that's interesting here is, and, and I don't know, you know, our students are our students. We're gonna own all of our students, but certainly, um, the, the change in enrollment that you see on those, that enrollment that I showed you, certainly has some, some play in where our test scores are. You know, if we've had a student one year in our system, that's a whole lot different than if we've had a student six or seven years in our system. And so that will have an impact, you know. Um, and that has certainly changed a lot over the last couple of years. And pull up math for you to take a quick look at math. And, and there is more data below here as well. So this actually breaks out the scores. It gives you drills a little further into their actual test scores on these. So with the curriculum being changed in all, over the last couple of years, is obviously the new curriculum is what they're basing the test scores on? No, that new curriculum is literally going into place this year. So um, these test scores are based on, on really what's been going on previous. Um, so this is last year's test. So um, it really is the kids we had sitting in the seats a year ago. The new curriculum will be tested on. Yep. To see what's your teaching students. So see if we can't start improving some of these that are, you know, if there's areas that we know we're struggling. And that, you know, and we have to go through and look at each curriculum area then and look at each, what we're doing, and not only at curriculum, you know, whether it be, um, you know, teaching methods or, or other things, you know, other factors that are out there. And I always keep in mind, and I always put this caveat. When we have great test scores, they look great. When we have not so great test scores, they don't look so great. It's one day. You know, they give the English language arts test. They do it pretty much in one day. 
So if something happened, that's fa that that's that's here as well. Um, and and I'll say that good, bad, and otherwise. You know, you know, if we hit that day and all the kids are, you know, they're firing on all cylinders, good. If we hit the day and they're not for some reason, that's going to show up too. Um, all in all, and I've started to do just some comparisons and things, and I've shown you comparisons in the past of different districts, and I've started to put that together. Our test scores are, we're not at 50%. We'd love to get to 50% and beyond. But as you can see where the state is, we're not way off the mark either, <laughs> you know. And so, you know, I don't want to sell this as these are horrible by any means. They're not. We know we have some areas we need to look at and start improving and, and making some changes. We look at, um, we do, um, throughout the year, we do benchmark testing with the kids. Not on the forward because that's only a one day shot, but we have other things that we do to look early on in the year, where are the kids at in their reading, where are they at in their math, and what are things that we can do to, you know, help improve kids along the way so that they do better um, and really in the end it's not about it's not all about just the test result but you know have we helped that student grow um, if we have a student who's absolutely down at not the, the absolute bottom not proficient area and we can get them to that next step which is basic that's an improvement Right? I mean, so those are the things we have to look at as well. Have we moved that child from not proficient to basic? And then can we help that child move from basic to proficient? Yeah. Um, and I can break this out just quickly so you can see the difference here. And again, we know, we know we've got some work cut out for us in math, as we did in English language arts. Um, and again, I'm not showing you all of the drilled down grade level data. It doesn't allow us to show that on this, but we can at least show it to you by middle school, elementary. So, um, let's show you. I'm going to pull up the entire district again for science. And then I'm, I, I will conclude with um, ACT in a moment, but I'll show you the science and social studies. Yep, that is obviously a positive. And again, not that the other areas are not. You know, we know we've got some areas to work on. Um, we can show you social studies. Very similar. What you're going to see is science and social studies, very similar scores. And as you saw, math, math and English language arts, very similar. I think there would... I think it would be safe to say there's probably a fairly high correlation between the students that are in basic in English language arts and maybe basic in math. It's not always exactly the same, but you would look and you'd see similar students in similar areas. So we know that we've got students to work on and work with in those areas. So let me pull up the ACT data for you. Hold on a minute. I got to change something here so that you can. So I'm going to pull this down first. On our left is our ACT average score. Uh, for our, this is school wide ACT. So this is the junior year when we give the ACT to every single student. Um, this is much improved for this year. So it would be this year's seniors. So last year's juniors. Big improvement from the year before. Again, each grade level, and especially, and this is the other caution I give you in a small school, and the, the state puts this out as a caution, especially the smaller the numbers are, this data can fluctuate wildly. It can be up and down wildly from grade level to grade level in a small school. Because keep in mind, one or two students can affect the proficient level that you see 
in a major way, especially when you're looking at an ACT where this was a group of 21, 20, 20 or 21 a year ago. So what you're seeing here is, but this is every student, so we did fairly well. Again, it's only 21 students. When you look at when you look at Lincoln High School next door, that's 350 students. You know, so their data set is much more stable over time. You know, they they have a lot more stability in their data just because there's more students. So I can show you just drill a couple of things into this so that you see this. Um, let me pull up. Pull up English. So you can see our students fairly well, you know, at least as a comparison to the state. What I wish uh, this was pulling up, and it's not right at the moment, is our proficiency level. Our proficiency level across the board for 11th grade on the ACT was at 55%. So. Um, the ACT is, you know, that's a high stakes test for a lot of kids. And, oh, and here we go. Overall, it was four, uh, 55, but you're going to see here in different areas it wasn't as much, and it just depends on the area. And I don't know why it wasn't pulling up in that other graph. What is interesting is if you see our math, so this is our math composite over here, 21.4. So that's math for our students. The state was at 19.9. 21.4 in math, I, again, I would just look at our counselor, highly respectable composite for math, 21.4, very good. Look at our proficiency, it's at 45. So again, compared to the state, we're doing well. It'd be nice to get our proficiency higher, um, but you know, to sometimes it all depends on the graph you're looking at. And I can quickly show you a couple of others. Reading. And again, I'm not sure why these graphs aren't pulling up. They should be. But I can pull down our reading score here for you. 21.8, very respectable in reading. Very good score in reading as a composite average. Um, I'll show you. Science. Sorry, there's no physical education, Mr. Okay, I got that data. Okay. <laughs> Science, again, our students on the composite are doing really well. As you can see, science, they have a very high proficiency expectation. Our composite average is doing really well. The proficiency, And I'll ex in a moment, when I'm done showing you these, I can maybe explain that a little bit, why the proficiency is way off in some of these. And again, I wish I could show you all of these. Our overall proficiency was 55, but it's not going to let me show you that. And our writing score. Writing is scored on a different scale. That's why it's so different. <laughs> so, um, so let me... I'll flip the lights back on and just talk for a moment about why the proficiency is so much different. The proficiency is based on the state standards that are out there. Um, and whether or not, and so they tried, they've tried to line up this ACT by our state standards. And in trying to do that, then they create some level of proficiency. So even though on the average, the kids did really well on it, whether they've hit those standards or not. And so they didn't change the standards when they adopted the ACT as the measure. You know, they didn't say, okay, does the ACT actually match those standards? But there's still, and I, they did, but it really, one was, both were created separately, independent of one another. And so they're trying to mesh two things together at the state level.
that weren't necessarily designed to be meshed together. So sometimes you see those proficiency rates are really kind of off as to what that composite is. Our students, this this senior class, yeah. very you have an average of twenty one. Twenty one point higher than forty percent proficiency. You would think. Um, really great average and remember that's the average of all the students so we certainly had students down in the 14 15 range we had students up in the 30 you know so that's that average um, I can tell you we did very well in the area uh, you know as a school there very well um, the proficiency gets a little tricky on that one um, but one of the things that we know we have to one of the things we're going to be working on this year through our in services uh, when we get into the second part of the school year is starting to rehone in our curriculum um, we've got curriculum out there and really two different systems we're going to try to get it all under one roof have the teachers go through and start to really review those things we know there's a couple of things we looked at science a couple of years ago but due to some personnel changes at that time uh, and some things going on within the science department we kind of put the brakes on adopting a new set of science standards and curriculum basically because the personnel had changed so the group that looked at it was not the group that was sitting in the building the very next year so we're going to re um, reintroduce that conversation now that we have stability back in um, you know and there's other conversations we need to have as well uh, social studies is adopting at the state level a new set of standards um, you know, and we have to look at our curriculum across many different areas. So when we do talk about, you know, this, this also brings up the question of talking about revenue and what we've been funding. One of the areas that we cut back in, you got to have a teacher in the classroom. Our teachers do have resources. We've gotten creative with resources. They don't always have the most modern or up-to-date resources, and that's one of those areas that we've kind of deferred off on the budget now in trying to make sure that we get even a semblance of close to a balanced budget. But that might be one of the things that we look at when we look at revenue is what, what truly needs to be the investment to make the curriculum modern, to bring the curriculum up to the standards, and do all that. And, you know, we're very cognizant that that we've got to do some reviewing and looking at those things so any questions no, good, good data good to see it from the, the different levels and the numbers out there and definitely I think the curriculum is a big thing we need to to look at to improve that I mean if the teachers to make them be able to improve the scores we need to make sure they have the, the resources right, the right resources and the products to do that so it's and like I say that I would I would definitely May, I would make an argument that would also say that our test scores, they're, they've downward crept. And I'll say crept. It's not been a, we haven't had a big drop off, but they've crept down a bit. We've added 90 students over the past three years, and we're adding them at all different grade levels. So when you're testing, when you think about our ninth grade class who got tested last year as eighth graders, 12 of those students were here as third graders. The other the other uh, 20, uh, 23 were not. They came as 6th, 7th, or 8th graders. So, you know, we've, we're filling in. One of the things our staff is doing, and I, I know there's some of them out there that would say, we're trying to figure out where the gaps are and start plugging the holes and filling those in. Because we do know that one thing. We've had a great product here. We still have a great product here. We put out good students. They need them longer. Yeah. Some of them. Yep. And so now we got to figure out. You know, so it's new challenges that we have to that we have to figure out how to. Some of it's curriculum. Some of it's figuring out the standards again. Some of it's figuring out how to fill in the gaps. So. All right. Good report. And moving on, questions and comments from people in attendance. Is there anyone that would like to address the board? No? No one signed up? No one. All right, we'll move on to consent agenda. Uh, seek a motion to approve the minutes of the past meeting of September 12th, 2018. So moved. Second. 
been a motion and a second. Any discussion? All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carried. Next item is consider approval of financial reports. Any questions on those? There is a couple of things that I'll just quickly make comment. One, there was an $8,000 outlay that's not really covered in the in yet. That's a Medicaid thing that we're working on. The money, it's a, the money will be there. It's coming in. It just has to deal with that end of it. And there was um, another special education piece that I know was maybe a little funky in there that Lisa and I had talked about that is escaping me at the moment. But again, it's just a bookkeeping piece that just has to get wrecked. Oh, it was an expenditure for testing materials that we had, but there's not a budget. There wasn't a budget item for it, and we had to. Uh, we'll ha we have to go in and create that budget item for it. It was things that we needed to get started for the year with some students, so that just wouldn't regularly necessarily be budgeted every single year. So that's why it wasn't in there. So, oh, can I do gifts too? Yeah. Gifts. <laughs> um, one is I have cards for you to sign for the cupola, um, so that we can send um, send cards off. For the, for the donors that we had there. Uh, the other is we did receive a $1,000 donation from Solaris. They give us $1,000 every year. Uh, and their expectation is we spend it on student things. Uh, um, and, they, and they, it's kind of like be creative with it. If the kids need, if they need something on the playground, if they need, um, you know, we've done benches, we've done playground equipment. Uh, last year we did that holiday meal. We gave some to the Ecology Club to help with the holiday meal. Um, so it's been a variety of things that we've done with that over the years. All right, with that, seek motion to approve financial reports. So moved. Second. Motion and a second. Any other discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carried. There's no unfinished business. Moving on to new business. Number eight, review future future district calendars. So I, I basically give you a bunch of calendars because I'm still in the drafting mode. Um, but I wanted to give you a, just a heads up as to what's coming up on the district calendars and how they might start developing and looking. Um, the, for the 1920 school year, um, school will start after September 1st because uh, Memorial Day weekend um, falls when we, you know, the first is actually a Sunday, the second is a Monday in the 1920 school year, and we'll be looking to go into that first week in June. Um, that would probably, um, I'm going to look at my calendar here, um, graduation would be uh, and like uh, would be May 31st, uh, it'd be Sunday, May 31st, and uh, there's not a whole, the 1920 calendars, I, I don't know that there's a whole lot of anything that's really out there. One thing I did toy with as an option was rather than having spring break at the end of March, putting spring break to align with um, Easter. Because it's literally two weeks away or a week away. So to, to maybe align spring break with Easter versus the last week of March. So just some different things that I've toyed with as options. Um, I mean, that's, that's, that's been on the calendar as the spring break in the past. It just depends on where Easter ends. Up. Yeah, pretty much that's the way that's typically worked out is... It's usually that last week of March, and that's pretty much, even in the trimesters, that's pretty much what Rapids has kept to and Nakusa, that they've kept to that. And, and we certainly can. That might just make that easier on, on families that way in the area. Uh, what I would like to do is put out uh, these options just to the staff as well for some comment. Uh, you know, are they seeing anything on there that's, you know, flashing red light? One of the things we looked at, it's kind of an interesting thing, uh, we looked at homecoming next year. We're looking at homecoming next year being the 20, the week of the 23rd through 27th. So rather than have an in-service day, and we typically have an in-service day at the end of September, rather than have it on a Friday, putting it on the Monday, 
after homecoming does a couple of things. One, it lines us up with Rapids, which is a good thing because we do occasionally joint in-service things. So that would allow us to have a day of joint in-service. But it also puts that day after the homecoming week, which sometimes is a good, everybody, uh, all the kids could maybe de-stress a little after homecoming week. But really more importantly, it gives us a joint in-service day with Wisconsin Rapids if we choose to use that that way. Um, the more interesting set of calendars, I really think, the 1920 doesn't really fluctuate a lot from what it looks like now, unless you want to do something like move where you're putting the Easter or spring break. The 2021 calendar it becomes very interesting because of when the start date is. <laughs> Still September 1, but it is a, a full, almost that full week before Labor Day. The, I gave you two options to look at, and both of them have us ending school. If I'm looking at this right, I thought I gave you the two options to look at that have us ending school. Yeah. Well, maybe one version had us ending school. Um, I think one version had us ending, if I'm looking at the right one here. And then the other option, one was ending on June 3rd. The other option was ending before Memorial Day. If I gave you the right calendars. I thought I did. Yep. One had us ending before Memorial Day. That would Because Memorial Day, Memorial Day happens to be the last day of May, that in the 21 year, we could end Memorial Day weekend. That I'm gonna say, I don't know if I looked over at my staff who happens to be here at the meeting, and they might say it's sometimes good to get kids out of the building when summer hits, but. Uh, what it really does, in order to do that, we have to crunch our in-service time and have a little bit different philosophy of in-service that year and really look at in-service as being before the school year. I have done some discussion with Pittsville. Pittsville actually puts every single one of their in-service days before the school year starts. They almost do two weeks of in-service before the school year starts. For us, in order to look at that as a possibility, it would be putting in-service at least a full week of in-service before school starts. When do we have to make a decision on this? Um, I would like to probably by December have have these calendars finalized so that we can get this out to people. Because yeah. we're, you know, we're, we should be looking at now getting that 1920 calendar up and ready for yeah. people. So. I think we can probably do it by November. But and we probably could. And, and my intent was really to bring this back to you then if there was more debate or questions. Uh, my ultimate is to we need to have it finalized by December is probably the, the, the latest we want to go. But I, like I said, I do want to bounce these off of, the, I wanted to bring it to you and now take it out to the staff and say, take a look at these. What are your comments? What are your questions? What are your concerns? What, what's the feedback on the spring break? I mean, it seems like every year it's going farther and farther into April, which sporting, sport events, I seem to take an issue on it, softball, track, I mean, what are, what's, what are the teachers, what are the, what well, are the students? Well, the last couple of years that we've had spring breaks really made no difference because we haven't been able to play sports until whenever in reality. So that's not been a big issue. I, I don't know. I might, you know, from the sporting side. We could for the first two weeks in April, just not the second. Yeah. I, I, I think people, when you look at, we, we have that time off in December, and then you have a day usually in January for semester, a day in February, maybe a day in March, but those are in-service days. To go through to Easter, you know, if, if I mean, you, we, there are some schools that just don't do spring break, and they're done always by Memorial Day. Yeah. The kicker there is, <laughs> I think you look at, um, I don't know, I, I'll give you the honest answer. I had a colleague of mine who used to call uh, February and March the dark pit of the school year because it gets long and you get to the point where 
cabin fever sets in and people people just need to get away from each other. Yeah. Also be good. Yep. Yep. And again, I'm. These are certainly in, in draft form, and my intent's to put some drafts out to the staff and say, "Give me your feedback." So, and then do, uh, as bring, well, bring that feedback back. Yeah, and and then maybe I'll be able to yeah. hone in. Obviously, a number one first. What's educationally sound? But you know, this is also we're a people business too, and so. Um, so how many snow days are built into the? Uh, I built it as I built the previous ones where, or where we changed it. So that's it'll follow that same procedure. We don't really in anymore. You don't have to think so much about days as much hours and minutes. We've got plenty of hours and minutes built in. So and if we well, if we do the if we do the theory if we do what we did a year ago, we got plenty of time built in here. So something drastic happened. Memorial Day, somehow you'd have, you'd have to figure out yep. how to make sure that we were definitely done. And and service. and maybe and having an having an in service in April yet would allow, depending on how much time you're using up snow days, would allow you to at least convert an in service to a, a regular school day if we needed to. Yeah. You know, the other thing we haven't done that um, other school districts have done is added hours and minutes as necessary. So we haven't had to do that. You know. So, Start earlier and get done yeah. later. If I mean, if it really becomes a big problem, so, and that way you avoid tacking on days at the end of the year is what you're avoiding. So, and again, that's more for your review, so no action necessary. All right. The next item is review of middle school, high school school violence drill. So, one of the new requirements by the law of the uh, uh, this is requirement of. I think I'm gonna, gonna reopen my computer here. I believe it's Act 143 for the School Safety and Security Act that was passed by the state legislature is that we report out to you when we do drills that are relevant to um, school violence, they call it. That's how they state it. This is essentially when we do a lockdown drill or an ALICE drill. Um, and, you know, our ALICE acronym, you know, the alert, lockdown, inform, counter, evade. Um, we've put our staff through the training. We continue to talk about these things uh, at in-services, staff meetings. Um, what we did early in the year, and I'll report, the law says that each school's principal has to report what they've done in their school. So Kara will need to give you a report. Um, the law also states it's supposed to be within 30 days. Well, we're, it's brand new law, so we're getting an implementation gap here. So I'm reporting to you, not quite within the 30 days. We're obviously gonna do this again. We'll make it within the 30 days um, so that we're reporting it to you. Um, but it basically says I'm supposed to give you a review of our school violence drill reports so, and evaluations. So. We did a walkthrough drill in early September. Uh, we presented a scenario to our staff and students. We make very clear that it is a drill uh, and a walkthrough when we do this. So at least um, we're not creating a, a, a situation of panic that we don't want to create. Um, but we present a scenario typically, um, you know, whether it's an intruder in a building or there were gunshots heard or you know, we could do, there was a uh, kidnapping or somebody abducted, all kinds of different scenarios that we can go through. Uh, and what we've had our faculty do is talk with the students in front of them at that moment about what the ALICE options are based on the scenario we give them. Are they going to blockade their room? Would that be the best thing to do? Are they going to evacuate? Are they going to, you know, lock down and get into a corner somewhere. What is the best scenario? What is the best option? You know, and, and truly, there are no great options in any of this. The whole point of Alice is giving people the tools to make a different decision than just sit and wait for somebody to come and do bad things. And so our staff, I think, has, from, from our analysis, 
and going around and talking, they have some serious conversations in those classrooms. And that building is a 512 building, so I'm reporting on the middle school, high school. They're having the same conversations with the fifth graders as they are, the 12th graders, because the reality says you have to have that conversation. What would you do here? And it is a different conversation depending on where you are in the building and what that scenario is. You know, if we said there was a gunshot heard on the second floor, people in the, in the tech ed area or in the gymnasium may have a very different reaction than people on the second or third floors and what they can do and what their alternatives are. And so um, during those times, um, myself, Mr. Raggy, our school resource officer, uh, Mrs. Schroda, um, Mrs. Christie, we'll walk through and ask, we'll literally go into each classroom and ask, it doesn't matter if we're asking the students or the staff, what, what's your decision? What are you gonna do in this scenario? Um, and so we let them tell us that. I don't think we've had a single instance where anybody has told us anything that wouldn't be a reasonable conclusion to make. Um, one item, a couple of comments, we were supposed to evaluate this, and they, but the state doesn't really give us a, like you have to evaluate it by X, Y, and Z. So I was just thinking things are, you know, when we do these, do a full staff debrief at the end of the day. You know, we kind of do an in the room quick on the go debrief with the, with the students and the staff in the rooms. And then we do an office debrief amongst all of us who've gone around and checked in um, because we kind of divide and conquer. Um, but to do that full staff debrief, debrief at some point, um, to do more of a simulation, uh, to maybe up the level of simulation, I do that with that piece of caution, though. I don't want to panic students. I don't want to panic staff. So in order to do that, we want to just think carefully about how we do that. I don't want to unduly panic somebody. Um, so, you know, those are some of the, some of the things that we've, you know, that we can go back and look at. Uh, like I said, Kara will need to give you an update on what's gone on in this building with that, so. Any thought about tying the discussions and simulations that you're, you're having regarding Act 143 into the, the monthly um, fire drills? reports um, it is actually all tied together so I sent you our drill report mm -hmm. and that's where we actually it's the same same, same report form, form. so um, it, we're required to to run um, we're required to run at least uh, at least two of the school violence drills in a school year required to do at least two tornado drills um, we can substitute other drills for um, fire drills and things as well okay. so um, it is certainly a conversation we have to come back to from time to time. Because there, there have been situations where the, where the fire department has come in and blocked an entrance. Yes. And, and then, yep. um, you know, there's, there's not smoke or, or, we, or we, whatever, but the kids yep. come to their usual door and it's like, nope, turn around, find yep. another way out. Yep. Yep. And so, we, in, within the fire drills, we, uh, yeah. not only does the fire department do that, we sometimes uh, will pull a student out of the line going out the door to see if their teacher notices that they're missing a student. Um, and actually, we kind of run that drill almost every month that we do a fire drill. You know, where, because there's always a student caught somewhere, they should, you know, that they're not in their classroom, they were on their way to the library, or they're on their way to the office or whatever. There's always a student out there, but yes. So, so that is my report on that. So. Okay, moving on, number 10, designate State Education Convention Board Delegate. Well, you, uh, you've, uh, each year we, so this is the delegate at the school board's convention, so. I mean, do, do we owe Mr. Martinson an explanation of what, what this is before we assign it to him? You won pretty hard last night. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, to, well, yeah. I, you know, Mrs. McGrath is not here, but I'm not yeah. going <laughs> to. No, 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 no. Um, Ben, for the, for the, just for the record, what was discussed last night at the Dells with the gentleman from the resolutions committee. Every year, the association solicits um, ideas for 
for resolutions that are debated and discussed at the convention from local boards, ranging from legislative things to curricular things to it, it provides a way for the, the school boards association to have an official position statewide relative to an issue. Um, the delegate assembly is always Wednesday afternoon. That lasts usually an hour, hour and a half. There are varying numbers of resolutions. Some of them are simple and are relatively quickly dispatched, up or down, yes or no. Some take a lot longer. I've been the delegate several times. Um, there's times that it's it's very enlightening. There's times it's very frustrating because the the um, the questions sometimes um, evolve into minutia about will will line two paragraph three be will or shall, you know. When it reaches that point, um, I, I start to lose patience. But the the, the whole concept is the whole concept is good, and it gives a um, it gives a picture of the the feelings of boards across the state overall in terms of all kinds of issues. There are there are districts where they have a special board meeting and they do nothing but deal with with their board's position on resolutions and and the board members vote and basically dictate to the delegate, okay, you're going to support or oppose this resolution. We have, to my knowledge, have never done that. Um, kind of left the the experience up to whoever the person is who happens to be our representative. So, I mean, that's kind of a, a thumbnail of what of what happens. Um, and each board, if they want, has a vote at that yes. assembly. Yes. If they send someone. Yes. So um, that's kind of what it does. Um, I would be willing to do it if no one else jumps forward. Bless you. <laughs> I've done it before. I, I have to. Um, if, if, if John does it, just for grins while we're there in, in January, stick your head in the hall. There's a, there's a, a visitor's gallery. You know, sit in there for a few minutes and watch the process just to give you a sense of what um, of, of how it how it operates or how it works. Um, I mean, I make I make fun of the situation, but it really is a a valuable experience in terms of getting a handle on what's going on. If John wants to do it, I will certainly I be happy to, to move, <laughs> move that he be our delegate. I don't think we do. We vote on that. I don't. Do we do we, do we need a, a motion? I, I, think I, I think we make a motion. I think we make a motion. Sure. Don't we? You can. Yes, I so move. I'll second it, Mr. Dobbin. Okay, there's a motion and a second. All those in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carried. Okay. Next item is opportunity for individual board member comment. Start on the end, Ben. Uh, just want to last night me and Leo went to the state uh, board conference down in Wisconsin Dells um, good conference on a lot of good topics very informative um, want to congratulate Leo last night he was a district 5 level 4 uh, award he got which means attendance to meetings and seminars so congratulations to Leo on that uh, receiving that award um, moving in for to the fall already, it's hard to believe, but fall sports, cross country, volleyball, football are winding down here. So I want to give the kids a congratulations. They did a heck of a job all around all three sports, and especially the coaches and the volunteer coaches. So good job to them. And uh, homecoming week's coming up. Got to thank the teachers and all the staff that helped make this week go on. It can be kind of a stressful week. So good job to them. And I guess get out if you can to the volleyball game and the football game cross-country meet as the fall sports wind down here. That's all I have. Okay, I am next. Um, good to see the uh, some of the freshmen coming here. Uh, and Hayden was the other one, but he was, that was Hayden Beckham, I'm assuming, yeah. right? So he wasn't a freshman. But there's two other freshmen that are jumping into the student council, and uh, that's good to see them here. It's always good to get them here talking in front of us. 
Um, <clears throat> and uh, a lot of the uh, kudos, uh, like Ben said, um, encourage everybody to get out and uh, enjoy the parade and the pep rally. That's always a good time. And uh, be ready to uh, cheer for the Brewers. Okay. <laughs> Leo. The deadline for registering to vote is October 17th. Uh, the deadline of, of electronic voter registration is October 17th. Um, the uh, League of Women, Women Voters is going to provide an opportunity for any Port Edward seniors um, who are going to be 18 or are 18 by November 2nd or November 6th to uh, to register to vote um, or for that matter any staff members who have not registered who might be be new um, it's really important that that you know people make sure that they have their their proper ID that they have their their proper uh, registration in place you can register in Wisconsin on the day of the election but it slows the process down um, if uh, those of you watching will make sure that you're properly registered and if you check with your, your friends and neighbors and colleagues at work and encourage everybody to go and vote. Vote for whoever you want to vote for, but, but participate as, a, as, a, as an active citizen in the process because we all benefit as a result. All right. And I'd like to uh, mention uh, the weather vane project and the cupola, I was able to attend the installation of the weather vane uh, a couple of weeks ago, and it was uh, nice to see the community come together and uh, raise money and and get it done in a short amount of time, and it really looks nice. And I'd also like to urge everyone to get out to vote. Uh, education is an important issue. Uh, especially on the statewide races and uh, so do your research and get out and vote and looking forward to homecoming week and all the activities that are included so next item is established future board meetings we have our budget hearing and annual meeting coming up October 29th on a Monday and our next Monthly school board meeting is Wednesday, November 14th. Just so that you know, we will have a policy update on November 14th. So that will, um, we've got a bunch, that'll be a bunch of policies on that one. That'll a be like bunch a bunch or just a little bit. A bunch are of we policies. Doing, are, we, are, we, are we doing a. Are we are we are we ending and restarting? Is it is that like it's being just a the update? It's updates. Yeah. So is that like being a little yeah. bit pregnant? And, I, and <laughs> the one thing fun. you the one thing you did do uh, when you passed the policy was you said that if they were editorial change, right. if right. they were if they were edit editing changes, like changing a word from capital to we we're not bringing those, and there's right. a bunch of those, but it's all the things that are substantive. So and it's oh, not. I mean, we're going to continue yeah, yeah. on just the continuation of the meeting, and we're going to take a quick break. We'll take a quick break and probably then sit down and go through the policy as a first reading. Right. So. That gives me a little better indication of, yes, it's going to take a little extra time. Yeah, well. <laughs> All right, with that, call for adjournment. So moved. I will second that.